I wanted to start off and tell you a little bit about uh, why the James Webb Space Telescope and not any other space telescope. What is this thing and what, what's the point? Why are we doing this? To go further in the field of astrophysics, we need to look farther. We need to look deeper. And so that's really what the James Webb Space Telescope is all about. And it's interesting to point out, right around the time when Hubble arrived at Mount Wilson was when they had first installed this big telescope. So he had access to the best telescope in the world. And he went and, so there's a theme here. When you have the best instrument around, you know, you can make, there's big discovery space of things you can find out. So here's the famous um, cone of time, which is meant to graphically depict something that's really kind of, you really can't write down on paper. And, um, when you're thinking about astrophysics and cosmology, you have to take into account the fourth dimension of time. So on the left, you see that glow, that's uh, the Big Bang. Uh, when, the, when the, uh, the very early conditions of the universe, and then moving to the right, you have present time. And we, we've measured the age of the universe to be about 14 billion years old. And then just uh, to put some of that 14 billion years in perspective, I just put the quote up there that, you know, if the full expanse of time, or 14 billion years, were stretched down to one year, then ratio-wise, Shakespeare wrote his plays one second ago. That blue-green picture there is actual data mapped from the COBE satellite, the Cosmic uh, uh, Microwave Background Explorer. And just an interesting side note, the principal investigator who designed the COBE spacecraft for NASA Goddard Space Flight Center and was able to fundamentally do the COBE measurement, map this early microwave radiation, essentially weigh the universe, is now the lead scientist for NASA's James Webb Space Telescope, which is what we're talking about today. Um, so here's a look, again, it's another kind of cone of time look. At, here's the Hubble Space Telescope on the left, and you're looking back in time. And I, I wanted to give you a quick analogy, and I heard another astronomer, uh, Margaret Geller, give this analogy, and it really liked it for me, so I'll just give it to you uh, quickly. But she talked about, you know, because people talk about JWC is like a time machine. It's like you're looking back in time. And you were looking back at these galaxies that are, that are 13 billion years old you're now looking to get more detail than you had with the Hubble Space Telescope. And the only way to do that and to collect more light is to have a bigger mirror. And then finally, there's a picture of the um, Hubble Ultra D field and then a simulated JWST field next to it to give you an idea of the more targets that we're gonna be able to observe. You spent all this energy talking about, you know, reaching back farther, earlier galaxies. There's some other really cool stuff we could do. Now that we have this really big infrared telescope out there that's super sensitive, what else could we do with it? Some of the most exciting things we might end up doing are things we weren't even designing it for then. And imagine when they're actually playing with it. This is a picture from Hubble, pretty famous, called the Pillars of Creation. Amazing picture, but we can't see what's inside. What's going on in there? Here's an infrared picture. It's the exact same spot on the sky, but now you're able to lift the curtain. You're looking with night vision goggles and that cloud disappears, that that's cold hydrogen helium gas that used to just block you when you're looking at visible light. Ten years ago, it was just an idea that there could be planets around other stars. There was no proof. Now, um, not only are there 800 confirmed extrasolar planets, there's targets for 1,200 more. And you better believe the scientists are going to want to go hunt them down with JWST. Talking about what we need going from Hubble to JWST, and it just makes it a little bit clearer the size of the Hubble mirror JWST and the overlaps of the different parts of the spectrum that we're planning to look at. Um, we're talking about something that's, you know, 10 times the light gathering capability. And so with that, I think we can switch over to hearing about building the telescope. And this is going to show how the telescope, as it came out of the rocket on orbit, on its way to go a million miles away, will unfurl. We call this the origami telescope. So. You're going to see how this comes apart. I'll describe some of the interesting things about it. And then I'll show you some pictures, pictures of actual real hardware. So the things you see now in a simulation, sunshield parts, mirrors, things in the bus, which is on the bottom, um, the exciting part of this stuff, we are actually building right now across this country, actually across the globe, in the sense that this is an international partnership that NASA has. So what we, Northrop Grumman, get to build the final end state. This thing will look like it does as an end observatory here in Redondo Beach. So kind of cool, Hubble got to do his stuff in California, right? We're gonna build this next thing right here in California. Parts are being built across the country and actually in Europe and in Canada. Uh, two partners with NASA, the European Space Agency and the Canadian Space Agency. 
So what's happening here is we've launched, we've come out of this five meter fairing, and now we have to unfurl into a full up telescope. And we're doing this as we're traveling a million miles to get this Lagrange point two, which I'll talk about. Here's a good slide right here. That's the way that I think of the telescope in really simplistic terms. I think of four major pieces. The optical telescope element. So the mirrors, right, and um, the, the composite structure that holds it. Behind that is the integrated science instrument module. And those instruments are being built. The University of Arizona and Lockheed Martin does one of them. Uh, the European Space Agency does one. Uh, JPL uh, does one, the Canadian Space Agency, so they're being built around. And then between the telescope and those instruments, we have our umbrella, our sun shield, another major piece, these five layers. And then at the bottom is the spacecraft bus. Uh, and that's the all important, anything that goes up into space has a bus. And it's a really cool analogy. It's the thing that's carrying this stuff up there. It's got the motor in it, and it's got the steering wheel in it, and it's got the gas pedal in it, right? It's got its propulsion. It's got its attitude control. It can point where we tell it to go. So you need that bus at the bottom to put these, this platform on, and every spacecraft that's up there will have a bus. So now I'm going to show you real pictures. This is the fun part. I got about, you know, six, seven, eight slides here. And everything I'm going to show you now is no longer in animation. This is stuff we have built. This is a third scale sun shield. So you see people standing there. It already looks pretty big, but that's only a third scale. Why is it only a third scale? Because we can't fit the full scale in the chamber. And then we started building template membranes. So there is one of the membranes that before we built the flight ones, we're going to build a whole set of them and just prove we can build them. And we just finished the test of the first six flight mirrors. And in the end of July, we're going to put the next six in. And at the end of the year, we're going to put the next six. So by early next year, we're going to have all 18 mirrors uh, ready to go. These things go all across the country from when they were powder to when they got formed to when they got machined to when they got polished to when they got gold coated and all the things that go on. So they got more frequent flyer miles than anything. Uh, she asked, what happens if, you know, all this stuff's going on? What if a hurricane goes through? You know, how do we deal with moving all this stuff around the country and weather? The tornadoes that hit in Alabama, our mirrors were at cryogenic temperatures, which is very expensive and a very hard test to run. The power goes out at Marshall Space Flight Center. We went to diesel generators. There's no lights in the place. We're running on diesel. We don't want to break the, the chamber, literally for five days to test those mirrors, because that's the dedication of the team down there. So what we're proving here, and here, and here, and then showing it in an end state in a simulator here, is that we can actually fold this thing and know what shape it's going to come in when it comes out. 